الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah Who is your Lord? In Arabic Man Rabbuk is the question the first question which will be asked of the soul after death. It addresses the trials of the grave, the beginning of the trials of the grave. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to teach his companions a dua. The way he used to teach a surah from the Quran. That dua which was to be said at the end of salah began Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr Oh Allah I seek refuge in you from the trials of the grave. It refers to a part of Muslim belief in the last day of the six pillars of Islam Allah requires of us that we believe in the last day the last day includes the signs which lead up to it the period of death and the period between death and resurrection which is referred to as the barzakh the barzakh, the interval, and the resurrection, the judgment, and then the distribution of people between heaven and hell. So, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord, represents the first of the abodes of the hereafter, the first stage that we go through. In a hadith which is considered mutawatir, meaning that it has been narrated by so many companions of the Prophet ﷺ, on all of the different levels of its narration, that it would be impossible for them to have agreed upon a lie. This is the highest level of certainty of the hadith narrations. In it, Prophet Muhammad sallam, as described by Al-Barra, Ibn Azib, Anas ibn Malik, Abu Huraira, and a number of other companions, that after the person has been placed in the grave, the soul is brought back to that person. And they hear the footsteps of those who had accompanied the kafan, the janaza, to the point of burial after they begin to walk away. And this is a part of the trial. What is to come? At this point, two angels, jet black, with blue eyes will sit that person up and ask them three questions. Man Rabbuk, Madinuk, Oman Nabiyuk. Who is your Lord? What was your religion? And who was your prophet? Knowing who our Lord is, is essential for us to have the correct faith. Of course, as a Muslim, somebody says, who is your Lord? With seeming ease, we can say Allah. Allah is our Lord. But Allah pointed out in the Quran, that it is not so simple as that. He said, 
In Surah Yusuf, verse 104, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most of those who believe in Allah are idolatrous. Most of those who claim to believe in God worship others besides God. So that tells us that knowing who our Lord is is not quite as simple as that. There are issues that we have to be clear about. Because of course if a person doesn't know who his Lord is, then the likelihood of him worshipping who his Lord isn't is very big. And that is why so much of the Quran is dedicated to informing us about Allah. That we would know who he is so we could fulfill the very purpose of our creation. Now, if we want to determine who knows who their Lord is, or to what degree we know what, who our Lord is, we can look at these questions. I'm going to mention a few questions and you can reflect on these and see where you stand with regards to them. And these questions are common questions raised by those who deny the existence of God in one way, shape, or form. The first of the questions commonly raised or stated by atheists, this is the question to you now, where do you stand with regards to this question? Do you agree with those who say that belief is a matter of blind faith? First question. Do you agree with those who say that belief is a matter of blind faith? Second question. And these have four sub questions. Are you stumped by any? or all of the following sub-questions. One, if everything has a creator, who created God? Two, if God can do anything, why can't he have a son? Three, if God is all-powerful, can he create a stone which is too heavy for him to lift? Four, if God is all good and able to do all things, then where did evil come from? These questions, what answers do we have for them? Third point, if our answers for these questions were as follows. If everything has a creator who created God, if our answer was he created himself, then we don't know who our Lord is. If for the second question, if God can do anything, why can't he have a son? The, quest, the answer is, he could, but he chose not to. Then you don't know your Lord. Third, if God is all-powerful, can he create a stone too heavy for him to lift? 
Yes. Then you don't know your Lord. For if God is all good and able to do all things, then where did evil come from? Satan or man made evil. If you said any of those or you thought any of those answers, then you don't know who your Lord is. A fourth big question, which also points to a lack of knowledge of who God is. Do you accept that God created the world and left it to run by itself? God created the world and left it to run by itself. If that sounds reasonable to you, then you definitely don't know who your God is. And that is the general conception of most people who would call themselves or came from Christian tradition today. Most people looking at Christianity, looking at the various other religions, come to this conclusion, believing that, yes, there must be a God, but these religions are all man-made, so therefore, God obviously created the world and left it to run on its own. Everybody has to find their own way. But one who holds that belief doesn't understand or know who God is. So, if we do want to know who God is, then definitely we have to be able to get past these basic questions. So let's go back to question number one. Do you agree with those who say that belief is a matter of blind faith? No. When one says, yeah, it's a matter of blind faith, it's a matter of faith. Basically, we have accepted the atheist claim that their disbelief in God is logical and our belief in God is illogical. It's just based on blind faith. It is not provable. Theirs, their approach is logical based on the other questions that we mentioned. However, the truth is that belief in God is logical and disbelief in God is illogical. It's the complete opposite. And we should have no doubts in our hearts that this is true. If we know our Lord, then we have no doubt about this. We can start by saying, if atheism was really logical, then the fathers of logic should have been atheists. Logic is traced back to the Greeks. And the leading philosophers amongst the Greeks, Plato and Aristotle, both of them believed in God. And they argued for the necessity of belief in God logically. Because as philosophers, logic was held on the highest position, highest status. To be able to logically present things. So... Plato's argument was the argument from design. That design indicates a designer. That is logical. That's what we see around us all the time. When we walk on the beach 
and we see a footprint in the sand. We don't stop and reflect how amazing it was that the sea washed ashore, sunk into the sand, and made a footprint. For the atheists, that's what they say. It's possible. The sea could sink in the sand and create what would appear to us to be a footprint. But that is not logical. Yes, it could. It is not impossible. But the greatest likelihood is that when we see that footprint, we know that somebody, another human being, stepped there. That's what we conclude. Sir Isaac Newton, on one occasion, had a, an instrument which was a, a means of demonstrating the movement of the planets around the sun. He had the sun in the middle, the different planets, and when you turn this crank, then the planets moved around the sun, you know, at different paces, etc. And one of his atheist friends stopped by to visit him, and he asked him, you know, when he saw it, he was really amazed. This is a wonderful uh, gadget. He said to him, who made it? So, I, so Isaac Newton responded to him saying, nobody. It just accidentally fell into that shape. The man looked at him and said, don't be silly. Don't be silly. You know. Who made it? He said, is what I said any more silly than what you say about the real world? Of the planets going around? You said it's all by accident. Isn't that even more foolish? As you wouldn't accept it on that small scale, which is so obvious, how are you going to accept it on that huge scale? So, the concept that design indicates a designer, this is a natural concept. Human beings function according to it all the time. But atheists say no. Design doesn't necessarily indicate a designer. So, if you take a bucket of paint and you throw it on the wall, it might splatter on the wall and it might look like a hand or a foot or a head. You know, it can take forms which look similar to just like sometimes you look up at the clouds in the sky and sometimes a cloud seems to take the shape of a head or a hand or a foot so they say so we say to them well if we put in all of the colors in a bucket then we throw that bucket of colors against the wall do you think it is possible that we could come out with a Mona Lisa? They would say, yeah. Yes, it's possible. Common sense for people who live in the real world, common sense tells us no. No way. No matter how many times you throw this bucket of colors against the wall, you are not going to come out with a Mona Lisa. It's not going to ever happen. The first time you throw it will be no different from the billionth time that you throw it. But according to them, no. If you keep throwing, keep mixing and throwing and mixing and throwing, one time it can happen. But as I said, common sense says no. The, the example they like to give for this is that if you put a hundred monkeys in a cage and you give them all typewriters, 
and pieces of paper. And I let, let them beat away at the keys with their heads and their feet and elbows and jump up and down. One of them will type out for you the whole Quran. Giving them, of course, Arabic typewriters, not English ones, right? They will type out for you the whole Quran from Fatiha to Nas, from beginning to end. Or the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. One of them will. Given an unlimited amount of time, if they just keep at it, one of them is going to do it. And they'll even put some numbers to it. They'll tell you it is the chance of it occurring is one to the minus trillion. But it's still one. But common sense, logic and reason tells us, no, it's not going to happen. So that's why we say, they are the ones who are illogical. They are calling on something which the human mind does not accept. It goes against all reason, all human experience. It goes against it. But that's what they hold on to. Aristotle, on the other hand, his argument was that the infinite regression of the cause and effect chain cannot possibly be. Meaning, that question, if everything has a creator, then who created God? Meaning, you go back. This was created by that one, and that one's created by the other one, that one's created by the other one. Keep going back and back to infinity. Or this God created, and then another God created that God, and another God created that God, and back to infinity. He said, no, that cannot be. There has to be a beginning point. Because saying that there is no beginning point, in other words, it's back to infinity, I mean, there is no beginning point is the same as saying it never started. Reality is that we are here now. Our existence is proof that there had to be a beginning point. And for that beginning point to take place, then the one that precipitated, caused that beginning to take place, had to himself or itself be without creation. Otherwise, it just falls back in that chain. There had to be one who was uncreated to start the process going. Otherwise, no beginning. So, that was Aristotle's argument. The Quran uses both arguments. The most common argument, of course, is the, the argument from design. Will you not reflect on how the camels were created? And the whole of creation around us. Just reflecting on how it's each, the, each element of creation, the complexity that is found there. When scientists go and look on the most microscopic level, what do they find as they take things apart and look inside? Take things apart and look inside, keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What do they find? They find order. Order all the way. If they go to the macroscopic, go the other way, out towards the sun, the planets, the universe, what do they find? Order. Everywhere, order. Design, order. It is not the, process, the, pro, the product of chaos. So the claim that everything was a product of accident, the Big Bang, boom, and here we are. This is like saying somebody drops an atomic bomb on a junkyard, you know a junkyard, 
where they have all the bits and pieces of cars. You can go down and get used pieces. Junkyard full of bits and pieces. You drop an atomic bomb in the junkyard and out rolls a Rolls Royce. Engine humming, door open, you just have to get in and drive away. This is what they're saying. Reality is that these bombs create chaos. They break things apart. They don't create things. So the logic that this world and its contents were created by God is so strong. It is so obvious that the vast majority of human beings believe in God. That's reality. Wherever you go in the world, whenever you go back in history, you find peoples believing in God. Those who don't believe in God, they are a very small number. They are exceptions. And even in the countries where we know that atheism, for example, became the order of the day, like Russia. Russia, where atheism was taught. It became the state religion. Denial of God's existence was a requirement for you to be promoted to have any position of note. Yet, once the Soviet Union fell apart, recent surveys of Europe with regards to the percentages in different countries that believe in God put Russia right up at the top. Some 80% of Russians believe in God's existence. What happened? They had been indoctrinated from the time of, you know, Lenin, Stalin, all those years. A century. Yet, as soon as the state apparatus was dismantled, the people reverted naturally back to belief in God. I remember speaking to a Chinese who had converted to Islam from communism and I asked the person, how? I mean, you were indoctrinated, Mao's thought, the Red Book, Cultural Revolution, all this stuff. How can you come to Islam? What happened? She said, actually, I always believed there was a God. But I just kept it inside. You just, you want to get ahead, you want to do anything, get into university to study, whatever. These things you just don't express. So once there was relaxation, then I could go and explore and find for myself what was in fact the religion of God. That's the reality. So, the fact that the vast majority of human beings believe in God is itself evidence for the existence of God. Furthermore, in 1997 in California, a uh, university in California, two researchers, neither of whom were Muslims, doing research on patients who had brain disorders, whether it were included schizophrenics and others or people with uh, epilepsy and other, other brain disorders. They were probing different parts of the brain, trying to assess where this was coming from, how they could possibly control it. What they found was that at the front part of the brain, when they probed this area, people who had it done had these massive religious experiences. Some, a presence of God was there. It's from the Muslim perspective, this is what Allah tells us in Surah Al-A'raf, the seventh chapter of the Quran, verse 172. 
Or it states there that Allah created all of human beings. All human beings at the time of the creation of Adam. Took from Adam all of his descendants. And made them bear witness that he was their Lord. And all human beings bore witness. Then they remained in that state in the Barzakh until the time for their birth on earth. The spirit was then put into human beings. They grew up and then the environment around them would affect them. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every newborn is born in a natural state of belief in God. This is the natural way. But it is the family, the environment, etc. around him or her that turns them into a Christian, a Jew, a Zoroastrian or whatever. Going back to our other group of questions. If everything has a creator who created God, we looked at that already in the answer given by Aristotle. Infinite regression, going back without having a creator, is not possible. There has to be a creator who was himself uncreated. The second question if God can do anything, why can't he have a son? That one can be included with the other question. If God is all-powerful, can he create a stone which is too heavy for him to lift? These questions and ones like them, we put under the general heading of the ludicrous. The ludicrous questions. Ludicrous meaning that they are illogical, and there are unreasonable questions from two perspectives. Or we could say really from one perspective, explain it in two different ways. Basically, to ask, can God do anything which will make him no longer God? That is a ludicrous question. To ask, can God do anything which, is, which will make him, in doing it, make him no longer God? That is illogical and unreasonable. So when we define God as one without beginning, to then ask, can God be born? That is illogical. If we define God as one without end, then to ask, can God die? That is illogical. So the issue of God doing ungodly things is not an issue of discussion. It is outside the realm of reasonable and logical discussion. So both of those questions we say are Asking whether God will do ungodly things. For God to have a son, one of his descriptions is that he is one and only. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. There's only one God. So to say, can God have a son? Meaning, if he had a son, what is that son going to be? Another God. Maybe a little God. When we have sons, they're little humans. Cows have calves. Cats have kittens. Little versions. So when God has a son, we have a little version of God? Or is it a full-blown version like himself? Or if it's a full-blown version, we have clearly two gods. So, for God to have a son is to no longer be true God who is only one. So it is a nonsensical question. It is a nonsensical question. 
The other question, which is one which usually messes up people, where they are not aware of how God works. When something happens in their lives, which they cannot find an explanation for, then their only conclusion is there can't be a God. So many times you talk to atheists, you ask, how did you get here? You know, your parents were both practicing Christians or Muslims or whatever. And you are now an atheist. How did you get there? The person will tell you something like, I had this aunt who was a wonderful woman. She was even nicer than my own parents. And one day, when she was taking me to the store, a big car came and just ran over her and killed her. Why? She was a good person. So many bad people around, why didn't it hit them? Why her? And of course, he doesn't have or she doesn't have an answer. No way to explain why her and not anybody else. So the only conclusion, not understanding how God operates, is to say there couldn't be a God. And this one is similar to the concept we can say is that if God is all good and able to do all things, where did evil come from? It's the same question. Where did evil come from? Reality is that everything which takes place in the world is a part of God's creation. It is by God's permission. Nothing takes place without his permission for it to take place. What we do know is that from our personal experience, there are many things which we might look at as being bad at one point in time and later on look at it as being good at another point in time. It appeared bad to us, but later on we, it turned out to be something really good. We can see it on the simple level of our children. When you have to take your child to the dentist first time and you gear him up or her up to go see the dentist, tell him how the dentist is a nice man, he's going to do nice things for you. And even when you come into the dental office, maybe the dentist will give the child a lollipop or something but once the kid is in the chair and business begins there is another situation happening here needles are going in the gum and the drill is going in bzzz, and the kid is screaming now after you take that kid home you cannot convince the kid that the dentist was a good man you can't convince him. Or if you want to take them back to the dentist again, oh boy, you know, you have to trick them. You don't tell them I'm taking you to the dentist. Otherwise, they go in the room and they're closing the door and they're not coming out. No way. Not going back to that man again. He's a bad man. That's how the child perceives it. It can only see the harm, the, the pain, the suffering that it had. It can't see as we do when we look ahead, we say, no, this pain is to prevent a greater pain. We can't see that. Those children can't see it. And that is what is demonstrated in the story of Al-Khidr. Al-Khidr and Prophet Moses in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf. Where Al-Khidr does certain acts which Prophet Moses could not understand the long-term or to, to know the long-term consequences. 
until Al Khidr explained it to him. He could only see Al Khidr taking the axe and breaking a hole in the boat after these people had so kindly taken them across the river and see him grab an innocent child and take off its head for no apparent reason until Al Khidr explained to him that the boat was saved by the hole put in it because there was a ruler coming down, a tyrant king coming down the river, and he was grabbing everybody's boat. So when he came to the boat with the hole in it, he left it. No need for that one. So the man's boat was saved by the hole that was put in it. And the boy whose life was taken, parents were righteous. That child was going to grow up and become such a fitness, such a trial for the parents, that it would drive them into a state of disbelief. So to protect the parents from the evil of the child, its life was taken. And Allah replaced that child with another, a girl, and that girl treated the parents well. And that's about the realities of life. We say it as every cloud has a silver lining. This is reality. We see it. Now, of course, what happens with people is they say, okay, we can see that. But, where is the good in the tsunami? Eh? The tsunami took how many thousands of lives? Where is the good in that one? Tell us the good. The fact that I cannot explain to you where the good is, does it mean there is no good? All it says is, I don't know where. But reality is that how God operates is that he does not permit anything to happen except that there is some good in it. But it doesn't mean that the evil that is done by those who do it, if it's done by people as opposed to quote-unquote nature, it doesn't mean that those people are excused, saying, oh, they're only doing God's will. Those who are murdering people, stealing. No, we don't say they're doing God's will. Yeah, yes, what they've done is in accordance with the will of God, meaning God has permitted them to do it, but that's not what God wants them to do. Because they will be punished for what they do. So that's how God works. In our day-to-day -day life, we easily recognize the need for instructions. We need, the need for instructions is well known. If a businessman set up a business, hired people to work in his business, brought them to the company, and then didn't tell them what they're supposed to do in the company, what do you think is going to happen? The punk company is going to run well and be successful? And No. He has to tell them what to do. He had a reason for which he hired them. It has to be out and explained to them. One who does something like that, where he doesn't inform people, would say it's unwise. Children going to school. If they're not informed as to what they're going to school for, what they're supposed to do in school, do you think they're just going to march into school and march into the classrooms and sit down and wait for the teacher? No. They're going to go to the playground. Swing on the swings, slide on the slides, have a good time. They're not going to go in the classrooms. You must tell them. So we recognize very easily that for anything to function, properly it must be in accordance with plans which are explained to those involved information has to be given otherwise we say that person is foolish we have a variety of different titles we got and one of the basic characteristics of god is that he is all wise 
الحكيم أحكم الحكيمين This is one of the basic characteristics. We prize and respect wisdom. Surely God is more wise than we are. This is common sense. So one who knows God knows automatically that God revealed his will to human beings in this world. The messages, revelation happened. It's real. And he revealed it through messengers. Prophets who would carry those messages to human beings. That is a necessity. Knowing God, knowing who God is, necessitates that conclusion. One who doesn't know God, who would assign to God idiocy, yes, they can say yes, God created the world, left it to run on its own. But knowing God removes these doubts and takes us to the ultimate conclusion that God revealed his word, sent messengers, and we need to know what was his word. We need to know who were his messengers. And we need to find out the very purpose of our existence. Why are we here? What were we created for? And this is something each and every Muslim is supposed to know. It is clearly explained in the Quran. Maybe if you ask a Christian and others, why were you created? They may have a difficulty finding an answer for it. Why? Because if you go through the Bible, there's no answer. You'll not find anywhere in the Bible where it says human beings were created for this purpose, specifically. No. People say, well, maybe it was for this, maybe it was for that, it's some of this and some of that, mix it together, come up with something. But to say in the scripture, in the Gita, or the Vedas, or the Gospels, or the Old Testament, find a verse where it says, God created human beings for this purpose. You don't find it. But in the Quran, you find it. And so, each and every Muslim has that clarity available for himself and for herself. Now, though the clarity is there, that doesn't necessarily mean that all Muslims know what is the purpose. In fact, on one occasion in Doha, Qatar, when a brother from India, Muslim, brought in a Hindu who he had been giving you know, some explanations about Islam to, and he wanted me to give him further clarity and explanation. He brought him into the office. We sat down, and I asked the Hindu young man, you know, what is the purpose of your creation? And he said, I don't know. No idea. So I said, well, see, that's the difference between your religion and mine. In mine, it is absolutely clear. Every Muslim knows. I turned to the brother, right, brother? He was looking at me with this blank st stare I said, uh-oh, uh-oh, hmm, well, I won't get caught in that one again. So, uh, actually, the reason is there in the Quran, you know, it's in a chapter known as Dhariyat, the 59th chapter, verse 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ insa." I did not create the jinn and human beings except to worship me. Purpose of creation is to worship God. Worship God, not meaning merely to raise up one's hands and to call on him in time of need, but to live a life, a complete life, in accordance with 
the commandments of God. This is worship. Submission to God in all aspects of life. This is the totality of the message. Knowing who our Lord is gives us that or should give us that understanding of the religion. That it is not a religion as is typically understood by about religions where you have set rituals done at a certain point in time. You know, this is when you are religious, you do your religious thing, then the rest of the time you do your life thing. No. For a Muslim, religion covers all aspects of life. From the time you wake up in the morning till the time you go to sleep at night, it is the duty of every Muslim to know what God has commanded, what instructions God has given for himself or herself for every minute of every day. It doesn't mean we, we're, we don't have the will and the ability to choose and decide to do things. Of course we do. But when we choose and decide to do things, we should do them in accordance with what God has taught us. That is the totality of religion, which is summed up in the verse in which God says to the prophet, to human beings, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, indeed my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. This is what we have been instructed. And this is the conclusion of knowing who is your Lord. So, inshallah, we will walk away from this session with some clarity. If those questions that I raised earlier left doubts in your minds, and I didn't ask people to put up their hands who understood and who didn't, I didn't want to embarrass anybody. I just went through it, assuming everybody knew. And this was only a reminder. But those issues we should be clear about. If we have read the Quran and we continue to read the Quran, the clarity of this will be obvious to us. If we read the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet, what he said, what he did, the guidance he gave, this will all be clear to us. And this is what we need to have as a living system that we follow throughout our lives. So that at the end of this life, when the time comes in the grave, and we are questioned, man rabbuk, we'll be able to say, rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. Barakallahu feekum, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.